clear. Um, Elise, this is the first time for you to come on to uh, Cruise News and Views. I want to welcome you and thank you for your time. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, you bet. Um, Thank you so much for having me on your program. Um, I'm a student in UC Santa Cruz's science communication program. It's a one-year master's degree program when we learn to report on and communicate about science. Um, I'm also a scientist. I just finished my PhD at Boise State University. I worked in a vaccine lab there, and before that, I worked in the vaccine clinical trial industry. And the pandemic was a really interesting time to be working in vaccines and clinical trials, and I got interested in science communication. And here we are in Santa Cruz learning how to communicate about science with the public. Yeah, you seem very successful. You ran a story in uh, the Sunday's Herald and the Mercury News, which I actually read about in Monday's Sentinel. uh, And I was fascinated by it and reached out to you to see if you would come on the show for us today. It's about Monterey Bay divers restoring the vital kelp forests. And you call them the redwoods of the sea. First, tell us about the connection that you make between the redwood forests and the kelp forests in our in our Santa Cruz Bay. Yeah, first I just want to preface this by saying I'm from Idaho and we don't have oceans in Idaho, so learning about these kelp forests and these ocean ecosystems was all totally new to me. Um, But I'm super excited to share what I've learned in this adventure. Um, So kelp forests and redwood forests are both very tall. Um, They make these huge vertical columns and canopies that provide food and shelter for hundreds of species. Uh, I've heard both the redwoods and the kelp forests described as supporting over a thousand species of animals. Um, insects and vertebrates, all kinds of things. So they both support these big, thriving ecosystems. Um, Kelp are actually brown algae. They're not plants, but uh, just like the redwoods, they grow grow up tall to towering heights. um, Kelp grows super fast. It can grow as much as one or two feet a day, and they can grow over 200 feet tall. And they have these little air-filled bladders all along their stipe. The stipe is like the stem. And those gas bladders hold them upright in the water column. So those kelp grow through the ocean, through the water column vertically, and they support this huge ecosystem of fish and snails and crabs and sea otters, the all-important sea otters. And so that's why people say they're like the redwoods of the ocean. They support this tons of life vertically. <laughs> Um, There's also an element of being part of the carbon cycle. So just like trees, kelp absorb and sequester carbon through photosynthesis. Um, But kelp actually absorbs way more carbon than trees, I understand. And um, when the kelp dies, it sinks all of that carbon down into the bottom of the ocean and it gets trapped down there. So it's a really important element of the carbon cycle, just like the redwood forests are. Elise, you write in your article about how once the California kelp forests um, were like you could barely swim through them. The divers um, uh, talk about how it was so dark and and difficult to navigate through. Um, But something happened. Uh, There was a great die off. Tell us about that. Yeah, the story is actually pretty complex. Um, It involves the urchins, but uh, I think I understand the biggest factor or a big factor was this marine heat wave that happened in 2014. It was a huge marine heat wave, um, just like a heat wave that we think of on land, um, but it happened in the ocean. And that heat wave extended all the way from Mexico to Alaska. They called it the blob. And the blob hung out in the Pacific Ocean for a long time, like a couple of years. Um, at least through 2016. So multiple years of warm water was just too much for the kelp. Um, Kelp really need cold water. So a lot of the kelp died in the heat wave. And that was a major factor that really tipped the ecosystem out of balance. But then another factor was um, the urchins. And their part of the story kind of starts back in the 1800s when we wiped out sea otters during the fur trade. Otters are a main urchin predator. 
Um, otters have to eat 25% of their body weight every single day so they can pack in a lot of urchins and clear the ocean floor of a lot of urchins. But those otters haven't really been around for a while. There's some in Monterey Bay, but there's not like booming populations of sea otters um, really anywhere. Um, and then another major sea urchin predator was this sunflower sea star which is a giant sea star that has up to 24 limbs, um, somewhere between, uh, you know, 10 or 12 limbs to 24 limbs. And the scientists told me it's extra large pizza sized. <laughs> this is a very big sea star. And those sea stars uh, suffered through this wasting disease in 2013. Um, they caught this horrible disease that just kind of melted their entire bodies. And those sea stars never recovered. So, Back to the urchins. Um, urchins are are normal in the ocean, and urchins eat kelp. Um, so the blob hit the ocean, wiped out the kelp. <laughs> the urchins were really hungry, and there was no predators to hunt them. So there was there's not that many otters left. The sea stars were gone because of this wasting disease, and the kelp were dying because of this marine heat wave. And these hungry, hungry urchins just stormed out of their cracks and crevices and looked for kelp and they kind of decimated everything that was left of the kelp forest. And those urchins covered the ocean floor uh, like a spiky purple carpet and um, they, they call them urchin barrens where these urchins have moved in and no life can live there. Nothing, there's no kelp to sustain the ecosystem. Um, so, and that, uh, the urchin barrens really tipped tip the ecosystem, um, you know, way out of balance, um, and it has not recovered yet. Um, so this uh, urchin barrens aren't, aren't abnormal themselves. Urchin barrens happen, um, but a lot of times the ecosystem recovers itself. But here it was really dramatic and it hasn't recovered yet. Um, the urchins are kind of interesting. The divers call them zombie urchins because they're pretty much zombies. Um, the one, the urchins that live in the barrens are not healthy. They're starving, and um, the divers kind of describe these urchin barrens as like moonscapes. Um, they just wiped out all of the life, and it's like if the redwood forest turned into a lifeless barren desert overnight. It's that dramatic. Um, the uh, one of the guys I interviewed, one of the people I interviewed for the article, Paul Souza, um, he told me that about this time he was diving in Monterey Bay. And he came over this ledge and came up on this swarm of urchins that had climbed up a stipe of kelp. And they were so heavy on that stipe that they knocked the entire thing down onto the sea floor. And then more urchins came in to feed. And he compared it to this, that scene in the movie World War Z where the zombies are storming the city and they crawl over each other and make like a ladder of zombies to get over the wall. Um, so these the urchin barrens are like really dramatic places. <laughs> Um, and they, they've affected different parts of the coast differently. Monterey Bay has mainly giant kelp, where the north coast has mainly bull kelp. There are two different kinds of kelp. There are different areas, different ge uh, geologies. So th there are different problems in trying to restore the balance to these ecosystems in different parts of the coast. You're listening to Elise Overgaard. This is Cruise News and Views. You also mentioned in your article that the otters won't eat the zombie urchins. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the urchin. So we eat urchins too, right? Like we eat them for sushi. <laughs> they call it uni. Um, when you open up, if you cut a purple urchin in half, there you can see there's five sections, and um, in each section has a gonad, and that's what we actually eat. If you open a healthy urchin, they're like these big, bright yellow, you know, delicious looking um, sec sections within the urchin. But in the in the barrens, they're starving. They're sick. They don't have. They're not healthy. So when you open up an urchin in an urchin barren, they're like shriveled and black and gross. And the otters know that. And the otters, it takes a lot of energy to dive, you know, to dive and to forage and to crack them open and all of that. So the urch, the otters are not diving in barrens. They're not clearing urchins out of the barrens. Right. Okay, so, Elise, uh, there is an organization that's leading the efforts to rid areas of urchins. Um, tell us about the organization and 
How is it that they're using hammers? <laughs> yeah. So the giant, giant kelp restoration project, two giants, like the giant project to restore giant kelp, <laughs> Um, is a nonprofit organization headed by Keith Rootsert. Um, he's a building systems engineer in Monterey. He has a day job, but he started this project as a way to try and save the giant kelp. Um, scuba divers are some of the only people who actually get to see and experience the kelp forest. We can't see them from land. So these divers who spent years enjoying these thriving forest ecosystems, and then all of a sudden they were just gone, these divers really care about restoring the life that they know used to exist there. So that's what this organization is doing. They get volunteers um, to go scuba dive in this area. Um, and the idea is to make space on the ocean floor, to clear the urchins off the floor, to make space for the kelp to reseed itself and get reestablished. Um, so they do that by using hammers to cull the urchins. Um, they use the hammers uh, to actually um, smash, <laughs> smash the urchins in each section. Um, they have to make sure those zombie urchins don't come back to life. I said there's five sections, um, and each of those sections has a reproductive organ. So if they don't smash up the entire urchin, um, if the entire urchin is not cold completely, it could come back to life and reproduce. So they're down there culling these urchins, um, but they leave the they leave the urchins down there. The other option would be to harvest the urchins and pull them up off of the floor. Um, but they've decided it's better to leave the remains down there and attract, try and attract fish and crabs and other life back to the areas. But since they're leaving them down there, they've got to make sure that they're cold all the way. So they use these hammers to, to make sure that happens. <laughs> Um, but I do want to mention the project has a lot of oversight. They're not just like out in the ocean smashing urchins by any means. They, they worked really hard to get permission from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. To raise, uh, they raised the bag limits on purple sea urchins in this one very specific area near Fisherman's Wharf in Monterey. It's a, a square, te you know, it's a, it's a test site. And they have a scientific advisory and monitoring collaborations um, with Reef Check, which has a West Coast Kelp Forest Monitoring Program. And they work with other agencies like um, Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary and NOAA. So they're going about this really scientifically. It's a literal experiment. Um, they even did a pilot study to figure out exactly how many urchins per square meter could be left down there. And that would still allow the kelp to grow in the area. So they have really specific targets for how many urchins to cull and how many to leave in that test area. There's an actual grid down at, on the ocean floor. And when divers go down, they get assigned to clear a specific section. And then they report back like how many urchins they culled out of that section. Nice. So is there a number on how many they've done? How many they've culled? Yeah, Keith's last report was that they have culled over 563,000 urchins, so over half a million urchins wow. um, since they started the project in April of 2021. Um, but, you know, the, the urchins keep reproducing. Um, so uh, Keith told me it's, it's not the number doesn't matter because it's the urchins that are still on the ocean floor that matter. Um, he did some back his back of the envelope calculations his estimates that, um, are that about 40 million new urchins were born in the same amount of time that they culled half a million so it's sort of shoveling water but they're taking really good care in this in this one specific test site you know to, to keep the urchin population down in that one site <laughs> Elise, what's next for the organization, and how would somebody be able to volunteer if they are interested? Yeah, um, so I know uh, Keith wants to expand the organization. He wants more divers. Um, he wants to go from hundreds of dives a year to thousands of dives a year. Um, and I know that he uh, to do that, he wants to or he wants to make scholarships um, available. It's expensive to get diet, to get trained and um, get equipment. So that's um, the goal for the organization is really to raise money to make scholarships to get more people involved. Um, it's really cool. The the entire organization is based on volunteer participation. You know, citizen scientists, um, and they get a lot of support from the community. Um, 
logistically, the next step, I think, is to keep wants to expand the test area from this one grid um, into a larger site and maybe change um, the where they're at. Um, the test site has a shale bottom, which is hard for kelp to grab hold of. So he'd like to move somewhere with granite flo ocean floor where the kelp could maybe hold on better and get better established. But that kind of means possibly encroaching in protected areas. Um, so, you know, the next step would be to get a scientific collection permit so they could expand into those areas. But that requires a petition and a change to the uh, fish and wildlife regulations. So that would be a lot of work and support. It's not, it's not happened yet, but I think that would be the next goal. At least over um, If people want oh, to yes. participate, I'm gonna, so there's information on the website about how to get involved. Um, people have to have an open water, uh, open water certification, and then there's a special kelp restoration certification that some dive shops in Monterey offer training for. Elise Overgaard, do you have the website that people can go to? Yeah, it's uh, www.g2kr.com. G2KR. Yep. All right. Elise Overgaard, thank you so much for bringing this wonderful article to us um, here at KSQD. Thank you. I hope you'll be back on soon. <laughs> Me too. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Elise Overgaard. This has been Cruise News and Views, um, the weekly radio.